Okay, time for convening having arrived. The Senate will come to order. Welcome everyone back on this seventh legislative day. Senate will come to order. Chair recognizes the senator from the 53rd District. Good morning, Mr. President. It's a great day at the Senate chambers today. A moment in history. Back there in 1733, Oglethorpe arrived and at a place he now called Georgia's first city, Savannah. The journal's been read and found to be correct. Thank you, Senator, for your trip down memory lane. I am glad that you were there to welcome Oglethorpe as he came to our beautiful city of Savannah. Is the objection dispensed with the reading of the journal? A reading of the journal is dispensed with. Is the objection confirmation of the journal? Chair hears none, and the journal is confirmed. All senators having bills and resolutions introduced, please bring them to the secretary's desk at this time. First reading in reference of Senate bills and resolutions. Senate Bill 332 by Senators Harper of the 17th, the 31st, Pratt of the 28th, and others. The bill be found in Act Amendment Article 1 of Chapter 2 of Title 127 of the OCGA relating to hunting, Natural trapping, Natural resources. Fish. Senate Bill 334 by Senators Dunter of the 45th, Miller of the 49th, and Schaefer of the 48th. The bill be found in Act Amendment Chapter 26. Health and Human Services. Senate Bill 335 by Senators Dunter of the 45th, Miller of the 49th, Butler of the 55th, and McCune of the 29th. The bill be found in Act Amendment Code Section Judiciary. 60. Senate Bill 336 by Senators Dunter of the 45th, Miller of the 49th, Butler of the 55th, and McCune of the 29th. The bill be found in Act Amendment Article 1 Judiciary. Senate Bill 3 and 37 by Senators Lunterman of the 45th, Miller of the 49th, and Tillery of the 19th. The bill be titled an act of Judiciary Article. Committee. Se Senate Bill 3 and 38 by Senator Ligon of the 3rd, Cassidy of the 46th, and McCune of the 29th, and others. The bill be titled an act Judiciary Committee. Senate Bill 3 and 39 by Senator Ligon of the 3rd, Schaefer of the 48th, McCune of the 29th, and others. The bill be titled an act of Article 2, Chapter Higher 3. Education. Senate Bill 3 and 40 by Senator Orock of the 36th, Williams of the 39th, Butler of the 55th, and others. The bill be titled an act of Article 1 of Chapter 9, Title 12 of the OCD. Natural Resources. Senate Bill 3 and 41 by Senator Anderson of the 24th, Moles of the 53rd, Jones Public of the Safety. Senate Resolution 595 by Senator Stone of the 23rd, a resolution honoring the life of Mr. Transportation. Mr. President, that concludes the order. Secretary Reed, Standing Committees. Mr. President, Senate Committee on State and Local Government Operations had our consideration of the following legislation, instructing to report the same back to the Senate with the following recommendation. Senate Bill 303 do pass. Senate Bill 305 do pass. Senate Bill 306 do pass. Senate Bill 307 do pass. Senate by Senator Kirk of the 13th. That concludes the order. Secretary will read bills for the second time. Senate Resolution 484 by Senator Harbison of the 15th, Senate Study Committee on Creating a Lottery Game to Benefit Veterans Create. Mr. President, that concludes the order. It is now time for the morning roll call. Time for the morning roll call. Are there any motions to excuse? Chair first will recognize the senator from the 52nd all the way in the back. Mr. President, I would ask unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 45th for business outside the Capitol. 14th? 45th. 45th. Without objection, the senator from the 45th will be excused. Chair recognizes the senator from the 15th, gentleman from Columbus. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 10th, attending of 10th. 10th. Please, um, without objection, the senator from the 10th will be excused. Please um, have he and his family in our thoughts and prayers uh, as he is um, at a funeral. Uh, Chair recognizes now the distinguished minority leader, the senator from the 41st. Mr. President, I move to excuse the senators from the 33rd and 35th for business outside the chamber. 33rd and 35th, without objection, the two senators will be excused. 
Chair now recognizes the newly elected senator from the 17th. Mr. President, somebody has a lot of faith in me this morning. I ask <laughs> unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the night for business outside the chamber. He's called your wife, Senator. He's called your wife. <laughs> Without objection, Senator from the 9th will be excused. Chair, recognize Senator from the 36th. Chair recognizes now the Senator from the 22nd. Mr. President, I ask for unanimous consent to excuse the Senator from the 43rd for business outside of the Capitol. 43rd, without objection, Senator from the 43rd will be excused. Chair, now recognize Senator from the 8th. Nope, He's, he made it. He's late. A lot to learn. Any other motions to excuse? Senators, please signify your presence by voting the yay switch. The secretary will unlock the machine. It is now time for our morning devotion, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate. Would ask that all senators please take your seats at this time. All senators please take your seats at this time. And doorkeepers, if you would, please secure the chamber as we are preparing for our morning devotion. It is now my distinct honor to recognize the distinguished senator from Bartow County, the senator from the 14th, to lead us in our pledge and introduce our chaplain of the day. Senator. Thank you, Mr. President. If you'll please rise and join me in honoring our flag. I pledge allegiance. Now the Georgia flag. Ladies and gentlemen, it truly is a treat today for me to bring before you um, not only an incredible speaker, a great pastor, but a dear friend. Um, Dr. King is the pastor of Liberty Square. Um, Church of God up in Bartow County, and we had the opportunity recently in our last session to honor the retiring uh, Reverend Joe Edwards. Dr. Joe Edwards, we, we passed a bill to be able to put a sign up for his intersection up there, and we all know how difficult it is to follow a great leader uh, in whatever capacity or wherever you're at. Dr. King has done that. Many times we have pastors come and speak to us. I want to put just a little bit of personality behind the gentleman that's about to speak. 
You see, when he was very young, he was diagnosed with inoperable brain tumor. Spent a fair amount of time in Scottish Rite. Very bleak, not expected to survive. Certainly, if he did survive, of course, Dr. King, maybe this explains a lot, but, although that's another story, but um, he certainly wouldn't be one of the gifted speakers that he is. Um, I could sit here and talk about where he graduated and all the things that he does, but he works hand-in-hand hand with many of the other churches up there and um, hundreds of different ministries from food banks to working with the Baptist churches to the relief when we had the tornadoes and so on. It's one of the largest churches in the area, continues to thrive when other churches are declining, and yet denomination is not who defines Dr. King, his lovely wife Jennifer, their two boys, nor Liberty Square. It's a passion to serve people and a passion to make sure that people understand that without Jesus Christ, nothing else matters. Dr. King, come and share a message with us, please. Thank you so much, Senator Thompson, for the invitation. It is a delight to be able to stand before you today. It is a great honor, and I appreciate so much uh, your service of the people of Georgia. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20, there is a spirited discussion between Jesus and the mother of James and John. She appeals to him to get her children to sit on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. And I guess this is living proof of at least two things. First of all, the fight between the left and the right is as old as the Bible. And trying to mark up a bill can even hit roadblocks with the Lord Jesus himself. Jesus responds to the mother of these two brothers and says... She does not know what she's even asking. She then says, or she's asked rather by Jesus, is, are they re rather prepared to drink the cup of suffering that would go along with a request? And Jesus says, these are not places for me to give away, but rather they were prepared for those by my Father. And what's more, this turned into a political disaster as the other ten disciples found out about the request of their friend's mother and they were then outraged. Jesus seeing all of this then calls everyone to himself and says to them, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lord their authority over others and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be that way among you. If you want to be great, Jesus said, then you must be a servant. Then he ends that passage in verse 28 by saying, Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. As leaders, I would humbly remind you of a couple of the abiding principles of truth. First, all authority comes from God. The people may have voted you in, but God raised you up. And for every degree of authority comes a level of responsibility. The scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. And for every level of responsibility, there comes a corresponding degree of service to others. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus had all authority. But even the person to whom was said, all authority has been given unto me, he said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. I would encourage you today that the principle of service over authority is something overlooked in our world. And the admonition of Jesus in this passage is for us to serve. Serve the people, not our agenda or even our interests, but remember the people placed you here. Many in our society have forgotten that and they use people, and they love things. But those who are servants have mastered the art of understanding we love people and use things. Don't only serve the people, serve God. He placed you in your seat, and to him we will give an account of all things. But most of all, serve one another. We can do so much more together than we can apart. We live in an age of gridlock, but remember that if we want to be great, we must be servant of all. 
The principles of humility and service that correspond with God's authority run through the entirety of the scriptures, and they have implications for every structure in our society. I believe that's why one of our presidents said, if you take out of your statutes, your constitution, and your family life, all that is taken from the sacred book, what would be left to bind society together? These are perilous, unprecedented times, but they are also times for someone or many someones to do something truly great. And Jesus said, if you want to be great, you got to be servant of all. Serve the people, serve God, serve one another. Martin Luther King Jr. said, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Mother Teresa said, a life not lived for others is not a life at all. Recognizing God's authority over our lives and using our authority to serve God and to serve people is a key not only to the fabric of society, but to the continued blessing of our republic. One of the great orators of American history, Daniel Webster, who served as a U.S. congressman and senator and a secretary of state for three different presidents, addressed the New York Historical Society in 1852. He said, if we and our posterity shall be true to the Christian religion, if we then shall live always in the fear of God and respect his commandments, if we as they shall maintain just moral sentiments and such conscientious convictions of duty and shall control the heart and the life, we may have the highest hopes of the future fortunes of our country. It will have no decline and fall, but go on prospering and to prosper. But if we and our posterity reject religious instruction and authority, violate the rules of eternal justice, trifle with the injunctions of morality, and recklessly destroy the political constitution that holds us together, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm us. It's in these moments that we recognize that it is God who has placed us where we are. It is God that we belong to and God that we serve. But we serve God by serving people and by working together. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you for the privilege, the power, and the freedom of prayer. I pray today for the men and women in this chamber. I pray your blessings on their families on all that they put their hands to. I pray for a revival of humility and service and decency in our nation. I pray for a recovery of common sense, a biblical worldview, and a genuine concern and love for our neighbor. I pray for the men and women before me today that they would have faith to believe what is possible. They would have courage to do what is right. They would have humility to serve their common man and the grace to recognize their creator. Forgive us, Lord, for misusing our authority and for being a law unto ourselves. Heal, O oh God, the division and the strife in our nation. Make us great, I pray, Lord, only through humility and service. I pray that you would bless the men and women, Lord, that serve tirelessly the needs of the people in this state. Bless the state of Georgia. Let her laws and statutes reflect the goodness and the righteousness of our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
If I could have the Senate's attention for a moment, um, it is always um, such a special honor to have uh, our wonderful physicians across the state that come and obviously give their time and energy to uh, look after us uh, in the me medical station. And we have a wonderful, wonderful physician who has been with us a number of times. And I would like to recognize at this moment the senator from uh, Bibb County, the senator from the 18th, to recognize our very distinguished doctor of the day. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce my good friend and a fine doctor from my district, Dr. Rana Muna, who attended uh, Mercy University School of Medicine. She completed her internal medicine residency at the Atlanta Medical Center, became board certified, and began her private practice in Macon. Dr. Muna specializes in health, well, wellness, and fitness, encouraging her patients to lose weight if necessary, if necessary for some of you, in order to control hypertension and onset of adult diabetes and lifestyle instead of using medication for everything. Dr. Muna uh, has served my community in many ways, including being president of the Bibb County uh, Medical Society in 2013. She serves as a delegate to the annual AMA House of Delegates. She continues to serve Bibb County Medical Society, and she's on the faculty at Mercer University School of Medicine. One of her proudest accomplishments, as we can all understand, is her son Christian, who is a United States Marine who's been deployed to Afghanistan three times, and he is Special Forces. How about that, Senator from the 30th? I know that gives a hooray from you. Dr. Muna is married to truly one of the nicest guys I have ever met, Joseph Egloff, who is in the chamber with us. He is escorting her today. He's a cattle farmer, and he's got the Rocking Chair Ranch down in Monroe County. He provides great top-quality grass-fed beef to several Middle Georgia restaurants and local markets, and I am indeed uh, honored to have her and her husband with us today. Dr. Muna, please come speak to us. Thank you. Thank you to my favorite senator. I appreciate being here. I want you to know this is not a political day for me. This is a day of service. And I'm here to help you in any way I can. If you're ill, come and see me. But if you just have a burning medical question, come and ask me. I love to talk about medicine. So I am s bringing you uh, cheers and greetings from the Bibb County Medical Society. And if you'd like to become more involved with us in any way, come bring me a business card. I'd love to meet you today. Thank you for letting me serve you. Somebody's light comes on, he, he recognizes. He has, the, he has the authority that he would recognize as mine. He's in a real tense situation. Yeah, I can see him. He's a speaker.
Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, we have a special recognition we would like to do. Secretary will read a resolution. Senate Resolution 596 by Senator Hill IV, a resolution recognizing Josh Reddick for his outstanding accomplishments in the sport of baseball and for other purposes. Whereas a longtime resident of Effingham County, Georgia, Josh Reddick began his baseball career with the Effingham County Recreation and Parks Department's youth, youth baseball program and later played for South Effingham High School. And whereas due to his outstanding athletic ability, dedication, and hard work, Josh signed a four-year contract with the Houston Astros in November 2016 and went on, on to win the American League Western Division, the American League Divisional Series against the Boston Red Sox, the American League Championship Series against the New York Yankees, and the Major League Baseball World Series Championship <laughs> against the Los Angeles Dodgers. And whereas his other accomplishments include hitting 32 home runs with the Oakland A's, winning the 2012 Rawlings Gold Glove Award, being named the Wilson Team Defensive Player of the Year in 2012 and 2013, and setting a career high in 2017 with a .314 season average, 13 home runs, and 82 RBIs. And whereas Josh also created the Josh Reddick Foundation, a Georgia domestic nonprofit corporation whose mission is to advocate for the youth of Effingham County, and which maintains, refurbishes, and beautifies recreational parks in Effingham County, offers the Josh Reddick Foundation student athlete scholarship to two high school senior athletes pursuing college and assists various other causes around the country. Now that therefore be resolved by the Senate that the members of this body recognize Josh Reddick for his outstanding accomplishments in the sport of baseball and extend their most sincere best wishes for continued success. That concludes the order. Is there objection to adoption of the resolution? Chairs none and the resolution is adopted. It is uh, always a great honor when we welcome um, Individuals that obviously have meant an, an awful lot to our state, but uh, certainly to have someone uh, here today, um, a major league baseball national um, world champion is quite remarkable. And so uh, to speak to the resolution and recognize our special guest, it's my honor now to call upon the distinguished senator from the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, Take a second to introduce the guests we have up here with Josh this morning. Uh, we've got Trey Saxon, who's the president of the foundation, of the uh, Josh Reddick Foundation, Donna Shepard, who's a treasurer, and Jed Elkins, who's referred to on his list as friend, but it, she's actually his girlfriend. So that's a, there's a lot of difference between friend and girlfriend, isn't there? But. If you're a baseball fan like I am, uh, then you like statistics about players and teams. <clears throat> and there are plenty of numbers about Josh Reddick that are noteworthy in a baseball sense. First, he's gotten where he is today, starting right fielder for the World Series champion Houston Astros through hard work and performance. He was drafted in the 17th round. To tell you, he really has gotten here by hard work and performance. He was drafted in the 17th round number 523 in 2009 when he was drafted. Now, I don't know how much you know about the baseball draft, but people who are drafted in the 17th round are not predicted to make the major leagues. And yet, in three years, he was, he was called up by the Boston Two. Red Sox. Two. 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 OK. That's what, that's what Josh is holding up. Two. Well, I took 2006 and subtracted from 2009. So. <laughs> Anyway, if he says two, it's two then. <laughs> he was there. But we fast forward to 2016 when Josh signed a contract with the Houston Astros for $52 million. Now, that means Josh is making over a million dollars a month. I figured out he's actually making $1,085 a day for today, and we're making, what, $173 today. So. <laughs> hey, who's counting? But, 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 but he batted 314, and we didn't bat nearly that well for sure. But... That was really a gratuitous uh, time for him to sign a contract with the Astros. No one knew, of course, they would become the American League champion and the, and the National League champion as well. But, you know, it, if you stopped right there, that would be a wonderful success story if that was all there was to tell about Josh Reddick. But that's not a complete picture of this young man. <clears throat> Josh has returned to the community where he was raised and played ball in the recreation leagues and in high school and has been giving back not just in money, because he's certainly done that, but for important causes, but in time invested in talking and interacting with young people with his message of hard work and dedication. The resolution mentions the two student scholarships that his foundation gives each year. 
Now, what is interesting about Josh's foundation is that it's not staffed and run by people in professional sports or from somewhere far away. The leadership of his foundation are local folks right who are standing behind me here today as well. And they're friends of his and family of his, and they're attuned to the needs of Effingham County. Most significantly, a few months ago, as Effingham County was completing work on a regional recreation facility, a need was identified for a handicapped accessible baseball field. Josh's foundation stepped forward and contributed a million dollars for a field with artificial turf and handicapped accessible dugouts. <clears throat> it's going to be completed in time for play this spring and it is state of the art. So Josh Reddick, I think, demonstrates the ideal role model we wish all professional athletes and sports stars would aspire to display. He's truly the local kid who made good but never forgot his home area. We claim Josh Reddick, and we're so glad that he still claims us. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present this resolution to our star of the day, Josh Reddick. Josh. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did I show it? Yeah. Thank you. thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you all for having me, and thank you for allowing me to bring a couple of guests with us. Um, but obviously, we thank, we thank the big man upstairs for all of us being here, but it's an honor to be here. Uh, very thankful to be recognized by the state that I call home and still come back to all the time. Uh, go dogs, by the way, unfortunately. <laughs> go dogs, but, uh, you know. We'll get there next year. But, yeah, it's, um, what we try to do here is we try to help out as much as we can locally. And any time we can help out the youth to a, f a future generation, if you, if you know, if you get to one kid, you, you've done something right in this life. So I'm just trying to leave something a little bit better to where we can make our future a little bit brighter and hopefully touch a few people to where they can continue to do the same. And we're very happy to do it here in the state of Georgia. And I want to say thank you again. Are there any co unanimous consents? Any senator wishing to rise on a point of personal privilege? Chair recognized Senator from the 40th. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. To members of the Senate, I think I've probably done this uh, five times in 19 point of personal privilege. Yesterday, after watching Tom Brady do to Jackson what he did to the Atlanta Falcons the year before, I somewhat reluctantly got in my car. I was invited to go to the Western Perimeter out where I live. It was an event called the Remembrance of the Holocaust. January the 27th, it'll be 73 years since Auschwitz, the concentration camp, was liberated by the Allies. You know, I, uh, I went with this somewhat reluctantly, to be honest with you. But when I got there, I was very surprised to see there were hundreds of people, number one. And number two, I think, which is really interesting, the number of young people. And I was very impressed by this because, you know, freedom comes with a price, and to see this number of young people was pretty impressive. So here's a factoid for all of you in the room that probably do not know this. 
Back before the United States ever got involved in World War II, Poland was invaded, the Nazis took over, and the purge began. And what happened back then, in Lithuania of all places, there was a Japanese consulate. His name was Chayun Sugihara. He openly defied his own government, who said this was not their involvement, and gave visas to 6,000 Jews. These Jews transversed across Russia, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and ended up in Japan. So, last night there were featured speakers at this event. I've never been to this before. And the first speaker was the grandson of this Consul General. And I was reminded in watching this about how important it is to step up when something really matters. Particularly in light of what we've seen the other day in Washington on this budget situation. The next speaker was one of the actual victims. This gentleman, one of the 6,000, became chair of the Chicago Board of Trade. He's a leading financier. He's 85 years old. It's been a long time since I've been in a room where I heard silence as this man spoke and talked about his history and what he went through. You know, we watch all this petty bickering in Washington, and we have our petty bickering down here, too. I've been part of it. We have our partisanship down here within this chamber and between the chambers. And yet, I guess the message for me, because here's the interesting thing. This Japanese consul was a Christian. He was a Christian. And here he is being honored by the Jewish people on their day of remembrance. Because I, too, have made a lot of probably party votes over the years. All of us have in this room. I guess my message from this, particularly in these times, is I hope, I hope what it really matters down here, that like the Consul General, Sugihara, I will have the courage to do what's right, even at political peril. And look, there's no promises with what I say. I just hope that I have the courage to do it. And to Mr. Sugihara, I really salute him. Something I never knew, that the Japanese actually played a part. I knew about the gentleman from, po from Poland, the 40,000 people, the Austrian, to save 40,000 Jews. But I guarantee you, I had no idea that somebody from Japan saved 6,000 people and had the guts to stand up for what he believed was right at his own peril. And by the way, he ended up in a Russian concentration camp for a year and a half, lost his job with the government, and yet did the right thing. Hopefully all of us, when the opportunity presents itself, can follow that lead. Thank you, Mr. President. Chair recognized Senator from the 34th, 34th on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I rise to make sure you all are aware that the Council of Probate Court Judges of Georgia is down here at the Capitol today, and I wanted to make sure I let it be known that my judge, uh, of probate co uh, courts down in Clayton County, Pam Ferguson and Atha uh, Pryor are both here today down here with the probate court judges of Georgia. So I just wanted to welcome them. Mr. President, I'll yield the well. Chair now recognize Senator from the 55th, 55th on a point of personal privilege.
Thank you, Mr. Me Mr. President, members of the Senate. I rise today on a point of personal privilege to introduce to you Mr. Felix King. Now I'm going to mess this up real good for you. Ari Muyek, I, a person that has traveled from afar to the great state of Georgia, the number one state in which to do business. He is known in his country of Nigeria as an entrepreneur who conceived the idea of owning his own business early in life. In 2004, he incorporated Oracle Experience Limited. And in 2014, he incorporated Mare Biscuit Company Limited, known as Mabisco. In a country where the unemployment rate is very high, he has been able to provide employment opportunities for nearly 1,000 individuals. Many youth have been gainfully engaged on a regular basis, thereby reducing the crime rate in Nigeria. Felix is also known as a philanthropist extraordinaire. In 2015, with the support of his wife, he started the Felix King Charity Foundation, known as the Foundation. The Foundation key objective is to give hope to poor and vulnerable widows and their children in communities across Nigeria, transforming their lives from despair to hope through different programs, such as business startup initiatives, farm aid programs, free food distribution, and medical aid. In the process, the foundation has helped more than 1,000 women and 3,000 children. Much like the state of Georgia, Felix is interested in the protections of women and children, and the Felix King Foundation has presented a bill in the Edo State House of Assembly for that purpose and is hopefully, hopeful that it will pass in the fall of 2018. Apart from his business and charity work, Felix is also a devoted family man who is loved by many and happily married. They are blessed with four children, Armanzelli, Zion, Great, and Shiloh, Chicago. He's a devoted Christian, an avid lover of good music and widely traveled. Will you join me in welcoming Mr. Felix King for visiting our state and the great state of Georgia? He has a delegation in the, the gallery. If you would just give him a big hand clap. Thank you so much. I right hope your well. business dealings in Georgia are successful. Uh, someone from my staff will guide you down to the floor and we can take pictures. Thank you so much, Mr. President. I'll you as well. Thank you, Senator. Chair now recognizes the distinguished Senator from Macon, the Senator from the 26th on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President and members uh, of the Senate. I rise today because we are not doing what's right. We have let the Department of Community Health vote and give away our health benefits. Mr. President, I rise because I'd like for you to ask the Chairman of Appropriations to see about what it would take for us to own and run our own health insurance plan like we used to. I rise because when I look at the senator from the 11th, who's a trained physician, who decides to give me a medication be because of a health problem. And I end up going to the pharmacy on the weekend. 
And then they tell me, well, they want you to take another drug so therefore you can't get your prescription. Now, I don't know how y'all deal with it, but when they tell you they want you to take another drug, you have to go what they call prior approval. It might take you forever to get it. And the reason is they get rebates. They get rebates on the drugs. And what we fail to realize now, Calmart is owned by CVS. And I know all of you got, in December, you got a new formulary from CVS that makes it difficult for you to survive. And the reason I'm down here, because, yes, I'm a state senator, but what about all those state employees that have nobody to talk to? What about those state employees who are diabetics and can't get their medicine on time? Ladies and gentlemen, we pay for it. This is not just given to us. We pay for it. Something is wrong with the system when now stockholders determine how much money they want to make and determine what your health care is. And I'm just bringing it up. I think it is time that we go back and pick up our own health insurance program. We did a pretty good job when we had it. We didn't have all of this mess going on about people being able to get their medicine on time. All of a sudden now, if you look at it, if you're up in age, and if you're six months from being where Medicare will pick it up, and you need operation, you can't get it. If you need operation six months prior to Medicare picking it up, under your state health benefit plan, unless you're in the emergency room about to die, you can't get that operation. And I'm telling you something's wrong with it. And we can fix it. We in this General Assembly can fix our health care plan where we are not always running back and forth trying to get our medicine just to live. See, a lot of y'all young, I used to be young, and I, could, I used to could run a 4 4 40 and run up and down the street. I got old now. Can barely walk. Being a diabetic is no fun. A lot of things happen. You have a heart attack. You end up with neuropathy in your feet. You can't halfway walk. And your medications determine what happens. And when you find a drug that reduces the amount of insulin that you take. It reduces the instances that you might have to go on dialysis. So what I'm saying to you, we need to look at where we are with our health care. And ladies and gentlemen, we can do a better job. I know we can do it because we used to run it ourselves. And remember, we put money in this, not CVS. We put the money in. Uh, Mr. President, I appreciate the time. Chair recognized Senator from the 27th on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. We have been reading a lot about Amazon, the paper, and where are they going to relocate their second headquarters. Let me first say that I absolutely love Amazon. I'm almost a daily shopper. My wife loves the Prime, and now there's something called Prime. Now you can get things in about two hours. So. I like the, uh, the way that Amazon is shaking things up and disrupting businesses. 
What I don't necessarily like is the lack of transparency that's going on and what is really going on and what it is going to cost Georgians at the current rate and discussions going on. I don't know, let me uh, say this as well, I do not know what the state of Georgia has offered to Amazon. What I do know is that the state of New Jersey has offered over $7 billion. I've read reports that Amazon is expecting anywhere from nine to $11 billion. And I know that Atlanta or Georgia is in the top 20, so we've gotta be up there somewhere. What do we get for this billions of dollars? Jobs, that's what we read about. Jobs, 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 50,000 jobs. Do you think the people that currently live in Georgia are going to fulfill and staff all 50,000 jobs? I highly doubt it. They're gonna take their executives and, the, and their employees that are currently in offsite locations uh, across the Eastern Sea or the Western Seaboard and relocate them here to Georgia. Now who's gonna pay for these new people that are moving to Georgia? Who's gonna pay for the roads that they're gonna drive on? Who's gonna pay for the schools that their kids go to? It's not gonna be Amazon and it's not gonna be the employees that work for Amazon because they're getting all of these tax breaks. It's going to be us, the citizens of Georgia. I like to ask people that are talking to me about Amazon, do you really want Amazon to come if you knew there was a possibility that your property tax increase would go up 50 to 75% in the next two, three, five years? Is it worth it to you then? I would like to encourage the leaders of our state that are currently negotiating with Amazon to remember the people of Georgia to remember those whose money you are spending. It is our tax money and it is us, the citizens of Georgia now, they're gonna have to pay for whatever price Amazon uh, is basically bribed with to come to our state. I'm a business guy. When I look at uh, spending money on, on investments, I like to look at something called return on investment or payback. At the current numbers, again, I've, I've already thrown out there, the return on investment is a 100 years. It's $200,000 a job. It would take about 100 years to get that back. Uh, with that, Mr. President, I yield the well. Chair recognizes Senator from the 36th on a point of personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, I rise today to mark the 45th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, the landmark Supreme Court decision that has been in place for 45 years. I think it's a good time today to reflect on the reality of women's lives before Roe versus Wade. Before Roe versus Wade, there were abortions happening in America, but they were in secret. They were back alley abortions, unsanitary conditions, unsafe conditions that led thousands of women bleeding to death and dying of infections annually. It's estimated that eight of 10 women in poverty who sought abortions before Roe versus Wade tried to perform it themselves at home. A very, very dangerous proposition which again led to the loss of lives Today we have a settled law in America and it says that a woman has a constitutional right to make reproductive decisions with her doctor without interference from politicians. A proposal that's been endorsed and supported by libertarians across this country for decades, for example. Seven in 10 Americans today agree that Roe versus Wade should remain the settled law of the land. That's seven in 10, folks. So when you hear the uh, mythology that more and more people are opposing women's right to abortion, that is exactly that, it is a myth. So we have this broad consensus, seven in 10 Americans, but yet still and again, our right as women to safe legal abortion and any other private and personal health decisions, continues to be under attack. Just in the last seven years, legislatures around the U.S. have seen right-wing efforts 
through introduction of 338 restrictions on access to abortion services. Threats to women's rights to make these private decisions have also crept into crucial areas of women's health care and access to affordable contraception, which has been proven to lead to increases in unplanned pregnancy. You know, half the pregnancies, and this, this is a figure that continues to surface over and over, no matter how you crunch the numbers, half of the pregnancies are unintended pregnancies. They're not planned, they were not intended, and yet uh, a, a, an egg is fertilized, which calls out for many enhancements in women's access to health care. We have actually a wing of folks, believe it or not, it's hard to believe, but they don't think women should have access to contraception, which is beyond crazy if you oppose abortion. And by the way, every person has the God-given right to have their own opinion about whether they would have an abortion themselves as a woman or support a woman to have an abortion. But that's, that's their personal opinion. It is not the job of the legislature to force that personal opinion on someone else. If you're against abortion, don't have one. But don't try to tear down the law of the land. And let me just say, before I take my seat, that the abortion rate is trending downward, according to the CDC. And that statistic can be attributed in significant part to the Affordable Care Act and what it has done for millions of American women. Now, because of the Affordable Care Act, these women have access to affordable preventable health care services, including contraception, birth control, STD screenings, mammograms, breastfeeding support and supplies, and cervical cancer screenings, all of those now broadly accessible to women who did not have that access before the Affordable Care Act. So the number, since the Affordable Care Act was enacted, the number of unwanted pregnancies has gone down, and it is in part due to the increased ability of women to obtain preventable care. History shows us abortions don't necessarily cease to exist because of the law. If the law were overturned and this historic Supreme Court decision undermined, it would take us back to a time when women were forced to back alley doctors that used tools uh, and, and procedures that were unsanitary and unsafe because that was all that was available to a woman in need at that time. Mr. Speaker, Tom Murphy notably supported Roe v. Wade and women's right to make their personal decisions around abortion services. And he said he had seen too many times the sad, sad story of women losing their lives from botched illegal abortions. And he would never want to see us go back to that time when women were forced time, time to kitchen expired. table abortions. It's my hope we'll keep the government from barging in to tell women what to do with our own bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, chair recognizes the distinguished senator from Henry County, the senator from the 17th, on a point of personal privilege. Has anybody seen the senator from the 17th? Once again, appears that he has run back over to the house to get his ego boosted. A lot of training still needed for the senator from the 17th, it appears. Once again, he has embarrassed the Senate and his constituents in Henry County. Chair and I, Senator of the 35th. Thank you, Mr. President, senators, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to ask that uh, we take a moment to give honor 
to a man who is being uh, funeralized right now. He's having his home going services. That's where Dr. Red is, right? Uh, Dr. Well, the senator from the 33rd, I forgot what I'm supposed to say the names of the senators, but that's where he is at Reverend Kenneth E. Marcus's homegoing service. He was an awesome man of God, the senior pastor of Turner Chapel AME Church in Marietta, Georgia, which started as a little chapel and ended up being a huge cathedral. Uh, we attended Morris Brown College together, so I've known him since we were little young people, and he was always an awesome man of God. And he was 63 years old, and he's been sick for about a year, and he has gone home to be with the Lord. So many of us will mourn for him for a long time, but he did so much for so many, and the AME Church uh, is going to really miss him. We served on the Board of Trustees for Morris Brown College, which is coming back again. And so at this time, if you would all join me in bowing your heads. Senator is requesting a moment of silence. If you, each of the senators would please stand, let us pray. Rest in peace, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Chair now recognizes the distinguished Senator from Columbus, Senator from 29th. Well, I made it to day seven, Mr. President. Um, and I didn't intend uh, to come down here today, but given some of the remarks that were made earlier, uh, I do think it's important to talk about the 45th anniversary of one of the most uh, troubling, infamous decisions of our Supreme Court in American history, where we denied the humanity of an entire class of human beings. Now, Roe versus Wade, since Roe versus Wade, over 60 million unborn children aborted in the United States. 60 million children who were unable to take their first step, to speak, to live. It is unconscionable. And that is why people of faith, people all over this country, stand vigil every year at this time to remember. We saw a vigil right here at our state capitol on Friday uh, remembering um, a march for life in Washington, D.C. in our nation's capital because no matter how long that decision remains in force, doesn't make it right, doesn't make it moral, um, you know, for a long time we had a decision we dealt with called the Dred Scott decision that denied the humanity of another class of human beings. And that was also decided by the Supreme Court. It was also the law of the land for some period of time. But it is incumbent upon all of us to do everything we can to protect life. And there is some good news. Um, abortions nationally are down. They're not at an all-time low, but they're on a downward trend and have been for several years. Um, we see the opportunities afforded by crisis pregnancy centers operated all over the nation uh, and in this state uh, to provide women who are facing agonizing uh, situations uh, the support they need to choose life. And it's so vitally important. We hear it from people all over the world, um, from uh, Pope Francis and others, that we need a culture of life, not a culture of death. And we need a culture of life in this country. And that's why so many of us over these last uh, seven years that I've served in the General Assembly have looked for each and every opportunity 
to protect innocent unborn life. And that vigil that we stand alongside millions of other people around this country on behalf of those who never had the opportunity to speak for themselves will continue until the day that we end this immoral practice in America. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the will. Thank you, Senator. Chair recognized Senator from the 6th on a point of personal privilege. The newly elected Senator who is at her seat to be recognized, I might add. Thank you, Mr. President and members of the Senate. I rise to address a pressing issue. Uh, this morning, the federal government started the work week um, with a shutdown. I'm going to refrain from laying blame at, as to any one party. But what I want to say is that the health and well-being of our children should not be used as a point of negotiation. The reauthorization of the Children's Health Insurance Program, known as CHIP, is a no-brainer. And so why does it matter for our state? Well, CHIP provides health and dental coverage to approximately 232,000 Georgia children annually. More specifically, all of us are familiar with Children's Health Care of Atlanta. The Scottish Rite campus is in my district, but it affects so many of us, from Senator William's son to even our chaplain today who talked about the care that he received as a child. 61% of CHOA patients are covered by CHIP. 61%. These are Georgia children. These are our children. So I urge each of you to reach out to members of our congressional delegation and urge them to reauthorize CHIP separate and apart from any budget deal. It is the right thing to do. I yield the well. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> we have a consent calendar. You have a consent calendar of privileged resolutions that are before you. Is there objection to agreeing to the consent calendar of privileged resolutions? Chair hears none, and the consent calendar of privileged resolutions are therefore adopted. Any motions to withdraw or commit? Where is that? Mr. Secretary, are there any objections filed on any of the local consent uh, or the local consent calendar? Mr. President, there are no objections filed. Is there objection agreeing to the report of committee on the state and local governmental operations, which is federal passage of the bill on the local consent calendar? The chair is none. All those in favor of the local consent calendar will vote aye. Those opposed, no. And the Secretary will unlock the machine. If I could have the Senate's attention uh, for a moment, we would like to welcome back the Senator from the 17th. He has, uh, he has arrived uh, once again. Speaker finally let him out. On the local consent calendar, the yeas are 45 and the nays are zero. These bills having received requisite constitutional majority is therefore adopted. Chair recognizes the distinguished majority leader, the senator from the 46th. Thank you, Mr. President. 
I move the Senate stand adjourned until 10 o'clock a.m. on Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018. 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Read the announcements. Rules will meet upon adjournment in 450 at the Capitol. Public safety will meet at 1 p.m. in Mez 1. Transportation will meet at 2 p.m. in 310 in the CLB. Finance has been canceled. Judiciary will meet at 4 p.m. in 307 in the CLB. That concludes the order. Any other announcements? The majority leader has moved the Senate stand adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. All those in favor will say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes clearly have it. We stand adjourned.